Welcome to the Career Society's Young Professional Night and Happy International Women's Day. YPN features industry professionals who share their career experiences and advice with the audience. And this program is made possible by the generous support from Young Ones on Foundation. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Sue Hugh, a, an acclaimed producer, writer, and executive producer of Pachinko, one of the most anticipated drama series of 2022. We are also joined by Ria Tobakowala, with whom Sue has launched the Thousand Miles Project, an incubator program to help bring more API stories to cinematic life and jumpstart football careers in the entertainment industry. And I know many of you, like me, are eagerly waiting for Pachinko to premiere or drop on Apple TV <laughs> at the end of this month, March 25th. Yeah. And based on the international best-selling novel of the same name, this epic series chronicles the hopes and dreams of four generations of Korean immigrant family. And here is the trailer. Ah, <laughs> It's so beautiful. It was really emotional watching on the big yeah. screen. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. Uh, seriously. So welcome to the Korea Society, Sue and Ria. Thank you. So great to have you here. So we have to start with the Pachinko. Um, so why did you decide to make this series? Oh, there's so many reasons. I think the question is why not? I mean, I, when you read and it's such a beautiful book, but then when you realize the promise of what it can be on a cinematic adaptation and just how big of a story you can tell to a global audience, that challenge was really exciting to me. And also at the end of the day, it's a story that I felt was really familiar. Um, I think so many people from an immigrant background, when they read the book, tap into the story of this is my parents' story, this is my grandparents' story, and just to be able to do something really primal, um, it, it just felt like a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. and. One thing that really surprised me from the very beginning, this is when you were adapting the yeah. book into a screenplay um, or the script. And I was really surprised when you said that you wanted to do this series in Korean and Japanese, not in English. I mean, the book was written in English, um, but you wanted Korean speaking and Japanese speaking actors. 
um, and the whole series in those languages with subtitles. And I want to reiterate that this is before the phenomenal success of Parasite and the Squid Game. This is before when people were used to that that yeah. one inch to two inch barrier of the subtitles. So I thought that was amazingly brave <laughs> choice. Um, why was it so important for you to do this in the in Korean and Japanese language? And did you have any any concerns from the Apple TV or other people who were involved in it? Yeah, that's a great question. I think fundamentally, part of the immigrant story is a horror story, right? Like the experience of moving to a country that is not yours, not knowing the language, not knowing the culture, not knowing the rules of society. To be able to really fully depict that, I think language is the crucial aspect of it. I think growing up, I remember so many times having to translate for my parents at the pharmacy, at the grocery store. So when you think about the story of Sunja going to Japan, imagine her walking in, you know, walking out of that train station, walking into a city for the first time, and she is hearing a language that is not yours. I think you can never fully experience that unless you do the show in the languages it was intended to be in. Mm. Um, and why hamper amazing actors you know, by making them speak right. a language that isn't theirs? That just never felt right to me. And I have to give Apple credit. I have to give all the buyers credit who, who bid on the project. The question definitely came up, but no one batted an eye when they said, you know, when I said, this has to be told in the three languages, whatever character speaks a certain language, that will be the language we will hear. And it just feels like right now is just a time for that. Absolutely. And I'm glad to hear that they were not too worried about it. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we're going to come back to the actors in a bit. But um, I want to ask you about the writer's room. And Ria, you can join in. I know sure. you were in that part yeah. of the process a little bit too. So basically what happens with a you know big series like this, yeah. um, you're the head writer, but you have a room full of writers, right, yeah. who helps you adapt the story into this you know, eight hour series. So, and I imagine some of them obviously probably were Korean Americans or Koreans who were familiar with this type of story and the language and the culture. Um, some of them probably were not. So what was that writer's room like? And what was that process like for you? Yeah, it was amazing. I, I, I just, I thought our writer's room was just the dream room. And we even came here. I think that's how right. you and I met. <laughs> is I brought the like, writer's room here to listen to a talk you had here on Han. Mm -hmm. um, we had six writers, and half of them were Korean and Korean American, because mm -hmm. I think they're two very different experiences, and I really wanted both experiences, because Solomon is someone who is Zainichi had moved to uh, America, and then obviously uh, Sunja is Korean. So we had a room full of Korean, Korean Americans. We also had a Nigerian American playwright, um, a Chinese American playwright, um, a Jewish American play, uh, screenwriter. And what was amazing to have this diversity of voices in the room um, is, I always like to think the best writers from what we're doing is we're creating a creative circuit, right? Mm. So you put writers together in a room, and if we can somehow mind meld our brains together, you get the best energies of all worlds. You know, we, we have poets and playwrights and screenwriters, and how do we just bring the energies together? And in terms of that room, we talked, I always like to build first on theme. What are the big themes of the show? What are the big questions of the show? Um, besides some of the obvious ones, uh, especially in Korean culture, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, fate. We talk a lot about, you know, Han and Jong. We also talked a lot about um, if this hadn't happened to our characters, who would they have turned out to be? And starting with questions, you get answers, or hopefully you get answers. But I mean, it was just sort of this dream room of people who really loved the book, loved the potential of what it could be on screen, and really wanted to be bold in the rep in the storytelling. That's great. I remember in the room too. I mean, given that half, about half the room was had a lot of experience with the history and the culture, and the other didn't. I remember we were sitting here during the conversation about Han and how all of us who are of a different background could say that resonates with some of my family's experience. These ideas of you know collective experiences that a culture might go through, whether it's colonization or otherwise, we were able to say. That feels true to us. And I, I thought one thing suited incredibly well in the room is 
help us just take everything apart and like look at the kernel, look at the atom of this human's experience. And you know, when I watch that trailer, I think of my grandmother and I think about the experiences that she's had, you know, between cu cultures and countries. And I thought that was a fun part of the room is, you know, we were just starting to talk to each other as humans. There was tissue boxes in the room and there's like a lot of truth saying and sharing that I thought was, was a really cool experience to be a part of. And I think it shows, particularly in that trailer too. Yeah, the old saying of when you're re being really, really specific, then it becomes very yeah. much universal, right? So the casting, um, you have some of the more, I mean, well-known is not even the right adjective to it, right? Um, actors like Yoon Ya Jung and Lee Min Ho. And again, you cast her before she was nominated and eventually won the Academy Award. Um, there's rising stars like Jin Ha, and then completely unknown ones like Min Ha Kim, who we see right here. So what were you looking for? I mean, all actors are, I'm sure, really great. All actors are beautiful. Yeah. Um, but what were you looking for and what, what makes you go like as a producer that that person is right for that role? That's a great question. I wish I had an easy answer, but so much of it comes down to just a gut feeling. This, this casting process for this show was tough. We had so many roles. It's an enormous cast with very, very emotionally pulling scenes. And in, in terms of which scenes I had the actors audition, I chose the hardest ones. So not only did actors have to audition, they had to memorize probably three scenes each, each about six to seven pages. So already I think it shows you who really wants it, right? Who really wants this role bad enough they're gonna memorize 20, 25 pages of lines um, and come prepared. And then after that, you know, you get a feeling for different types of people like, ah, that's not who I, I didn't picture Isak that way, but this, this actor is really bringing something so unique and interesting to this role. And then after you narrow it down, then you have them do chemistry reads, which is really, really when you know. So for example, Minha, uh, you know, all of our Sunja finalists, I think there were three Sunja finalists, they auditioned with three Hanzu finalists and you find the best chemistry. So you have incredible, incredible actors, but the question is who has that magic touch with one another? Um, and with Minha and, and Minho, they just have that connection. You made Imino audition for you? He did. <laughs> and that's he's amazing. very generous with his time. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So, and the production, I think we have some um, exclusive behind the scene photos um, that people can watch. But the production, <laughs> it was scheduled to start the summer of 2020. Yeah. And we all know what happened in the beginning of 2020. Um, so, well, obvious challenge of trying to do this multinational cast and crew. Yeah. And you were planning to shoot in Korea and Japan on location. Um, what were the challenges? <laughs> I mean, I mean yeah, where I, do you begin? I mean, uh, yeah, where do you begin? Other than that, the world was turning upside down, and um, if, given that this was going to be a very difficult shoot to begin with, yeah, yeah, and a lot of uncertainty that mm -hmm. felt just hard to wade through. I mean, I think I remember the very beginning of the pandemic, March, we were doing prep. It was supposed to be Japan, Korea, Vancouver. And then when the pandemic broke out, the very first thing you ask yourself is, how can I think about making a TV show when the world is just, you know, going through hell? So it really gives me, it really forces you to question what it is we do. And I, th I think it is, a, it is a testament to the show and to all the people who love the show that they said, let's do it. The world needs to believe in something, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we had to rejigger production. I mean, I ha our production team, they were heroes because they probably did 20, 30 production plans, right? There was a version where it was like, no, it's going to be just Korea. No, it's going to be just Canada. How do we get into Japan? Um, finally, we started shooting in November 2020. And we shot in Korea, half Korea, half Vancouver. And other than the, you know, once the things are going, because your title 
is also a showrunner, right? So what do you do as a showrunner? <laughs> and what do you think is the most important thing for you to make everything go so smoothly, yeah. as smooth as possible? Um, and how much of it is like planning and how much of it is as you must have done pivoting and improvising. So first of all, let's start with that description of the showrunner. Yeah, my mom wants to know as well. <laughs> um, she's, also, she's like, what, what exactly do you do? Not yeah. do? What do you not do? I know. Right, right. So in the best and worst, I mean, every showrunner is different and approaches the job differently. In the best and worst example, it's someone who does everything and hopefully nothing, if that makes sense. Um, I think the most important job I have after the writing is to bring together this team of people who will just bring it alive. I need to trust that they will really bring their hearts and souls into it. And then after that, you know, one of the things is I've lived with this show for so long that a lot of it is just constant gut checks. Does this feel right? Is this right? Um, and just the collaboration of working with the directors, all the department heads, the producers, the actors, you know, the lighting team is just, it's this amazing conversation that happens where you all build the show together. Um, I think it's knowing when to stop, step in and say, hey, you know, can we try doing it this way? And when to say, like, no, this, they have it. They're doing it so, you know, they're bringing this what, better than what I imagined. Um, and at the end of the day, it's also a fiscal responsibility, right? Like when I sell a show, I make a promise that the show comes in on a certain budget. And sometimes I don't always succeed. But you, it is a responsibility. Right. And, and having seen Sue, I think the other thing, when I'm like, oh, like, how do you explain what she did? Like, I'm like, she's also like the story keeper. So from huh. like, you know, when I first joined her, it was 2019, and she'd already sold the show, and she was about to start her writer's room, and now she's about to, you know, premiere the show. And it's for almost three years now, through every phase of the process, she's there. And I think deciding what feels true to the story that you wanted to tell from the outset and how to build your team around it. But I'm always like, you know, I remember hearing her kind of thrall being like, wow, that feels like that vision continued through the entire process. It's a long process. <laughs> yeah. So when we think of, say, film, yeah. uh, cinema, a lot of people tend to think of the director as somebody who's responsible for, you know, the overall um, sort of the feel of the movie, the you know quality of the movie. But when we talk about something like a TV series or should we say streaming series like Pachinko, we do think, tend to think of executive producers or the showrunners. Um, you work with two directors yeah. and both of them happen to be Korean American, um, Kogunada, right? Kogunada and Justin Chan. Yeah. Um, how important was it for you to have a Korean American or a Korean director behind the camera for this series? Was that intentional or, you know, I'm sure it's a mix yeah. of everything, but, um, and what was your relationship with the directors? Cause I'm sure they also had their own visions. Yeah. And when you do, for example, a eight episode series, series, and then, you know, one director does a few and then the other director does a yeah. few, how do you just keep everything feel like it's a one whole thing? So these are such good questions. One of the things, this is not an eight episode series. Oh. It's meant to be. Oh, that's right. It's the, the first season. First season. First season. Yes. But that has been something I think a lot of people think, they're like, how are they going to do the book in eight episodes? Like, no, it's meant to be 32 episodes mm -hmm. over four seasons. We shot the first season, which is eight episodes. And to tackle the first question as to whether or not how important it was to have Korean, Korean American directors, it was both extremely important at the same time as something that couldn't necessarily be the only spotlight question. Meaning, I wanted the best directors for the show, period. But how it was very difficult for me to think that someone who grew outside, grew up outside the Korean, Korean American experience could understand this show really innately. Um, and with Justin Koganada, what I got was the best of both worlds. Not only did they understand the heart of being a Korean, Korean American, but they also are visionary film directors. It's great when things work out that way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I also know that you went to a film school for grad school. Yeah. Um, 
is this what you thought you were end up doing or when you went to film school what did you want it to be um no when i was in film school i was a very big snob and thought television would be beneath <laughs> me um but this was before the te television boom uh, like when i was in film school television wasn't something i don't it wasn't even something people thought about ever wanted to be filmmakers um and then as i was leaving film school is really when television just all of a sudden exploded and you realize, wait a minute, I can tell these immersive, bigger stories in some ways and not to do a TV versus film argument, which I'm happily, you know, <laughs> happy to do, but you can't do this as a film. There's no way Pachinko could be a two hour movie. Um, it, it would feel bastardized and small. Um, and so I went to film school wanting to be the next great, you know, great American filmmaker, and I am now, I think, a, a very, very happy television maker. Great. How about you, Ria? I know you're also a filmmaker. Um, what was your idea of a filmmaker before you started? Yeah, I mean, you think, you know, you're like, oh, I'm going to direct my movie. Everyone's going to see it. And that's kind of like the world that you're going to be in. And I think when I went through f film school, um, kind of the rise of streaming and, and kind of also in some ways the changing nature of like independent filmmaking um, was really kind of in this like stormy moment. And, but also like a great moment, a moment of opportunity. I, I think when I talk to, you know, people within my world who are, who are like, okay, what do I do next? Um, you know, there's a traditional path that can still exist, but there's just so much more. And I'm seeing kind of, um, you know, my fellow, fellow filmmakers also doing very different things. So I think now I was like, oh, I definitely one day would love to direct a feature. And I think that's still always uh, a part of the dream. But I've, I've grown up on TV. I've, I've, every day after school, I'd watch TV. So I kind of knew that the, the importance and the value of television was something that was never lost on me and something that I thought, uh, you know, I wanted to be a part of. So I think I kind of knew that at some point in film school that TV was a route that I wanted to take. So what was the biggest difference sort of between what you imagined a filmmaker does versus when you actually became one and tried to make your own film or your own TV show? Um, what was the biggest difference? I always say that the most surprising thing is how little I write. You know, you would think, you know, a writer would spend most of their, his or her time writing. And I always liken it to, I, 20% of my job is writing and 80% is producing or the business or development or ideation. Um, I think that's something that was surprising to me. Yeah. I think the first thing that popped in my head when you said that was money <laughs> and that, oh, you know, I've done a lot of independent work and you're constantly trying to figure out how do you make this thing and where'd you get the money? And so I think that's something that I didn't really realize coming in. For some reason, I thought like there'd be a pot of gold and the other side of the rainbow and I just pick at it whenever I wanted to, but that you really are thinking about how you tell a story that you can frankly get a community around and people around in order for you to tell it. So those kind of more businessy elements, I didn't uh, realize I would need. So it does sound like being a showrunner basically means you are doing everything at once, pretty much. So what makes somebody a good showrunner? Oh, I don't know if there's a magic, I don't know if there's that perfect equation for it. Um, I always say 50% of my job is saying no and 50% of my job is saying yes mm -hmm. and is knowing when to say no and when to say yes. And it's, the problems come when you cross wire those answers. Um, and that includes saying yes and no to myself, right? Uh, saying, no, this isn't worth this fight. Let it go. Or like, no, this is worth that fight. Let's do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. But then what do you think, you know, we all have this image, right? Of what a filmmaker is, you know, like you probably, it, which is also Hollywood, you know, uh, production of you know, sort of the result of what Hollywood or you know the movie industry presents as you know the director as the mad genius or a tortured genius whatever and then the you know sort of the business executives who are always wanting to 
you know, monetize everything and all they care about is, you know, money and, um, but like as a showrunner, it seems like you have to take care of both ends, yeah. the financial responsibility, as you said before, and the artistic integrity of this project you so believe in so that you work on it for years and years and years. So how do you keep that balance? Like how to make it financially responsible, um, but also really go for that artistic integrity? I think, you know, in terms of you get a budget for a show and you, you know, sign off on that budget and say, this is what I will make the show for. Beyond that, I strongly believe that, and, I, and I've worked with incredible, I'm just lucky that I got to work with partners and collaborators who believe similarly to me that you have to do whatever it takes to make it good. And it's sometimes making decisions that are tough, um, but it's when you compromise um, some of those things that I think you don't make things that you're as proud of. And I learned, this wasn't something I knew at the very beginning of my career. You know, at the beginning of my career, when I'm just so excited that someone's given me the opportunity, you say, yes, yes, yes. And I feel like the more experience I am getting, the older I am getting, people respect sometimes when you do say no. Um, but if there's no rhyme or reason as to when a show turns out good or what, when a show turns out to be a success, that's so out of my control in some ways. So once you realize that there is so much chaos and that's part of the magic, you just have to let go which is very hard for me. Mm. So let's talk about a little bit about your other project that is named The Thousand Miles Project, which you two launched, just launched together. Um, so first of all, please uh, sort of explain to our viewers, what is A Thousand Mile Project? For sure. Yeah, I can start with it. So, uh, you know, and soon I kind of came together and said, what can we do? You know, we both, as you mentioned, been to film school. And we're like, well, what can we do to help people who maybe didn't go to film school or did go to film school, but are looking for that way in? And, and how do we think about it? And Sue had, you know, this great opportunity with Universal Content Productions to put together some sort of incubator. So we were like, all right, let's do this. And so came together with this concept, which we named the Thousand Mile Project after a proverb that says, you know, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. And we're like, how can we be that single step? Um, so that was kind of like the kind of the co concept, con kind of the, what we conceived the idea behind. Um, and then, you know, built this thing that I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, so the incubator is a kind of a two, two prong thing that we're working on. Um, the first part is we're inviting up to like 20, 25 uh, writers, and they can be from any type of background, artistic background, to join workshops. We're going to connect them with industry understanding about how to come up with a great television show. Um, and then from there, uh, they'll hopefully get to meet some, some people within the industry that we're calling the aunties and uncles of the program, um, and uh, then allow them to submit a idea for a show. And then we're going to pick up to three to be part of a uh, development lab that Sue and I will work on with Universal Content Productions. And the idea is, you know, up to three stories may be potentially pitched and um, hopefully, you know, made to show down the line. So when you are, so you're accepting applications, right? And people have to pitch their story. What is like the best pitch you've ever heard? And what is like the worst pitch that one can ever make? Like when you hear it from their yeah. side? I think... For me, you can tell when someone believes in their idea or they don't believe in the idea. Um, and you can't fake that. You know, people think I can fake confidence. And I, they're to some extent. But I feel like the pictures that you always remember the most, and they may not be perfect stories. They may have problems in certain aspects. But the ones that you always remember the most, you're like, oh, this person's going to bleed for this. Um, I would much rather work with someone who had a messy project that they're willing to bleed over than someone who has a perfect project that just one out of 10 projects they have in their bag, right? Because mm -hmm. this, you know, I always tell people who ask me for advice, it's just too hard. As glamorous, you know, you say it's, we have this glamorous notion of, you know, Hollywood. But what I tell them is when you're shooting, I wake up at six in the morning and I go to sleep at two or three in the morning, right? 
you are so exhausted, you're so tired, you're getting feedback from a thousand people, you're getting notes from a hundred people, you're getting everyone telling you everything that's gone wrong, and most of that you also feel a lot of self-doubt in yourself, right? Um, it's just too hard. The glamour is 1%. So you have to love this to want to do it. And you can't fake that love. So I feel like the pictures that I always remember the most is like you feel that in the room. Hmm. That's great. But so how do you, so this is, this may sound like kind of a silly question, but so there are so many contents being produced, right? And everybody, everybody seems to have this idea of that, oh, this will be a great movie or this will be a great TV series, whatever that is. And then for the people who actually be able to write that down and somehow turn that into an idea, what do, you, what, what, what do you need to do that in order to do that? Being able to just sit down and work or imagination? I, I, I bet it's a combination of all the different things. But what, what makes somebody you know, motivated enough to actually, instead of just talking about it, do something about it? Like, for example, when you were um, doing your first film, mm -hmm. what, what made you just keep going for that? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to really what Sue just said. There's, there's some, you know, there's some fire in you, like that fire in your belly, where you're like, I have to tell this story, and I have to tell it this way. You know, this is the the art form that I've chosen that I want to express this story in. And I think it just it just sits with you. I remember the first nights I was working on, um, you know, my first film. I just I couldn't fall asleep. I had to find ways to get myself to fall asleep because I was just thinking about it and just became, you know. You could tell a story that's tied to your personal experience, or you can tell something about a world very different from yours, but there's some kernel to whatever you're telling that's true to your experience. And I think that kind of thing is what um, I think always motivated me. But one thing that did kind of encourage me earlier was that when you said Apple didn't even bat an eye when you said you wanted to tell the story in yeah. different languages. Um, but still, we, you know, Series like Pachinko is not something we are used to seeing. Yeah. Um, the people, you know, the actors, even though, you know, they are very famous, um, they used to be sort of put into this little niche of either international films or, you know, um, art house films mm -hmm. and things like that. So do you see that things are changing a little? And I know one of the reasons you guys launched this project, um, the Thousand, Mi Thousand Miles Project, is to encourage more diverse um, storytelling, more, you know, sort of inclusive views of different experiences. Um, do you see that things are changing given, you know, obviously the huge success of, you know, films like Parasite um, and Squid Game, but they are actually like Korean products. Yeah. They're from Korea. So do you see it within the US, you know, entertainment industry? Do you see some attitude changing? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, and it's funny, as we have consolidation on the corporate level, right? What's interesting is you have fewer and fewer buyers, which is bad for, for filmmakers that you have so few buyers. But the flip side is, is those corporations are global corporations. They can't just cater to a small, you know, America is one country now. Uh, so by being a global company, you know, the Apples, the Netflix, the Amazons, they are forced to realize that an audience is diverse, that audiences across the world speak multiple, multiple languages, and that the same content isn't going to work anymore. So things are definitely changing. It's exciting, you know, but we don't have as many buyers. Yeah, because that was one of the things I wanted to ask you because all the companies that you just mentioned, Amazon, Netflix, Apple, um, Hulu, they are streaming, yeah. um, which is completely different ball game, so to speak, when you th thought of the usual, you know, box office, opening day weekend of box office, um, 
of the movie industry or the Nielsen ratings on yeah. TVs um, that you, you know people use to sort of hold on to as a gauge of the success. And it's interesting that you say that the buyers are smaller, even though we feel like we are inundated with content. Yeah. So is it better or worse for the creatives th these days when you have this completely new market, new way of delivery system, basically, and with you know potential to reach so many different audiences, as you said, all over the world, all at the yeah. same time, right? Um, so maybe better or worse is not the right question, but what do you see changing and how do you adapt to it as, as a you know, creative yeah. who's making the content? All I know is I'm so, I'm, and I don't mean this for this to be controversial, I am so glad that the streamers are here because what happens is if you rely on only theatrical releases, or if you only rely on Nielsen ratings, the popular kid wins, right? Because guess who people are going to see, what movies are going to see theater? They're going to see the ones that have the most posters, the most advertising dollars. Those are like the popular kids. Those are those white boy filmmakers, right? Um, with streamers, I think they've really, dem they've leveled the playing field a bit. And I may be delusional, maybe it won't last long, but in, I, I think the reason why the Apples, Amazons, they're taking chances on shows like Pachinko is because they can wait for the success of it. Pachinko doesn't have to be a success on that first night. It doesn't have to deliver Nielsen ratings on that first viewing because that's, that's such an impossible burden, right? Right. Um, and, and I do, Apple has been amazing partners. They understand that this is a long tail game for this show. Mm -hmm. I think and it's, it's definitely, you know, when I think about it from the perspective of the Thousand Mile Project, Pachinko is such a like landmark moment. Say, look at this show. You know, look at the faces in this show, and that this is something that is. You know, I have all kinds of different people talking about it and bringing it up and saying, "I'm so excited," you know, for Pachinko. And I think it just shows that there's a very large appetite beyond just like a niche, you know, uh, particular culture wanting something of their culture. But broadly speaking, I think we're all, you know, we're all have a higher appetite for a lot more. Um, and, you know, when we're looking at the Thousand Mile Project and thinking about all of these different varying cultures within the Asian and Pacific Islander um, communities and, and the blendings of them, there's just, you know, you start thinking there's ex ex exponential amount of opportunities to tell stories that we've never seen before, that I think we all really want something fresh. That's great. And we are all looking for, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's the joke, right? You always have something right at your fingertip you think but then when you're flipping through I'm there's like, nothing, there's to, nothing watch. to watch <laughs> you know, it's always and you're always waiting for well when, when's the next thing coming um so then how do you market something like pachinko um because it is such a specific well i mean i shouldn't say it's specific. it's gorgeous it's yeah. beautiful you know it's gonna be epic and scope it's historical so how do you mark how are you guys marketing this I mean, the Apple team have been geniuses, and I think one of the things that's been most most gratifying is they said from the beginning we're not going to marginalize this show, right? Let's show, let's sell the show that we have. Um, it's an epic show, right? It's I we've always said let's go back to those films and TV shows we used to have that used to be family viewing experiences. Let's go back to Lawrence of Arabia. Let's go back to those big 80s miniseries when people wanted to tell these big scope um, projects. And when you look at the marketing plan for this, it's really to say, it's a story of one woman and the ripple effect she has. And that ripple effect is enormous. Um, and I, I think I love the marketing around this campaign because it feels like you're really being sold the show we have. I always, the worst is when you feel you have a marketing campaign, you're like, that's not my show. <laughs> but it's like, oh no, what are they? But this is it. Mm. And that must be very gratifying to see it. I mean, because yeah. you've been working on this for so many years and then just to finally see it come alive, really. Yeah. And I'm sure there are many, many people um, who can't wait to see it. Um, but then, so we are doing this on International Women's Day, yeah. and it is a story of one woman. Um, do you think, 
again, you know, inherently movies, films, you know, we always talk, we always talk about the male gaze. Um, it's always, it's sort of inherently from the male's point of view, even if it's a story about a woman, um, you're a woman, you two are a woman working behind the scenes. Um, there seems to be more and more women doing that. Do you see that part changing of the woman sort of telling their story on the screen? I'm curious what you think. It feels like it, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I feel like there's still a lot to go. So, you know, you, you look at some of the numbers in terms of, you know, percentage of shows directed by women. It's still very, very low. Or you look at the amount of female showrunners. I don't know what the f exact number is, but I think it's still not at parity. And, um, you know, so I think that there's still a lot of growth and there is some direction, but and I think it, it's going to take a lot more effort. Yeah, and I think in addition to having parity behind and in front of the camera, I think we need to shift what we think of as popular entertainment a little bit mm. or what we value. You know, one of the conversations we had on this show is there's a scene where Young Jin, Sunja's mother, is making her daughter a bowl of rice on her wedding night. Um, and I was speaking with Nico, our composer, who's brilliant, and saying, you know, I want you to give us music that makes this act of making rice for a daughter feel sacred, right? Mm. Meaning, I think women's emotions, women's work, women's relationships shouldn't feel sidelined or shouldn't feel, I don't know, minimized. small, minimized, yeah. is let's make this act of making rice feel big. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, when a man, when you have stories of a man, you know, a man changing into a superhero costume, you always have this bombastic music. Um, I think women need to be afforded the same sense of scale as men do, mm -hmm. even in, within our stories. Yeah, that's a great point. And do you, I mean, one of the reasons, you know, probably you were attracted to this particular story was that it was from the female point of view, yeah. maybe, that it's a story of immigrant. Um, but were you also looking for that sort of opportunity to like do this? Because, you know, it's the kind of, again, it's the kind of thing that you just don't see sort of, you know, I always used to say um, Game of Thrones has nothing when it's compared to like a Korean, um, you know, royal court dramas. Yeah. Um, you know, we've seen all that before, the intrigues and everything, but you just don't see that in that epic scale that the Hollywood can do. So was this sort of the opportunity to tell this, as you said, stories that used to be sort of minimized in a much grander scale? Yeah, absolutely. And just personally, I'm attracted to challenges, right? Mm -hmm. So like for me, I just seem to be drawn to shows that if someone says, oh, that's impossible to make, that just makes me want to make it more. Because mm. um, why would you want to tell the same story twice? And I, maybe it's ego, but I, and, but I think a lot of women have this ego and they should have this ego because men have it in spades, which is I want to do something just as big. Because mm. your previous works, they weren't necessarily like Asian, like yeah. Asian American oriented or so was did, did it feel like the right time for you to tell this story like what you've learned throughout the years being the professional that you are in this industry like did it feel like this was the right moment to tell this story for you I mean that's such a great question I've asked myself that like why now and not just that's always in all pitches when you go to buyers and say please buy this show <laughs> the question you always get is why now um you know, four years ago when I was thinking about this show, I think at the heart of it, I'm drawn to stories about indomitable people, right? I mean, the show before this was about, you know, um, as far from Pachinko as possible, right? <laughs> it's about um, the British patriarchy and about a bunch of men who get stuck in the ice. But then when you look at what these men did to survive and how much they wanted to live, you're just 
it's inspiring to me to know that there are people out there who will do whatever it takes to survive, but they won't break their spirits or their moral code. I think everything I'm interested in is always going to have that kind of DNA. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at Pachinko, I don't, it wasn't, I'm trying, and I really want to fact check myself. I don't think there was any cynicism about like, oh, it's time to do an Asian show. Let's do it. You know, it was, yeah. This is the story. This is the yeah. story. Yeah. yeah. It, having, being, you know, Women's Day, Sue, someone I've always looked up to is uh, watching her, you know, how she's built her career and the canon of story and stories that she's building. One thing that I think that when you see the industry kind of going back to one of your other questions is oftentimes women are like put in a box, like this is all that they can do. And when I look at someone like Sue and the breadth of projects she's done, she's proving like, I'm a woman, but I can do actually anything. And I think that's something we're not seeing as much of. And I'm hoping we see more in the industry, see more Sue's where it's like, you know, put her in coach. She can do something, something she wants to do um, versus I think, some of the issues that we're running into, whether it's, you know, gender or race, that it's like you can only do this own thing because this is, we only look at a two-dimensional um, experience. Right. I mean, if men can tell women's stories, why can't women exactly. tell men's stories, yeah. right, if you do it well? But also at the same time, um, it seemed like such a, it's a, such a personal story too. Um, and so I just cannot wait to see it. Um, at the same time, you are at this point in your career, you have this huge project that came together. And I was just wondering, what can you tell somebody um, who's starting on this journey? Yeah. You know, when they are, I'm sure there are going to be so many people, male, female, um, you know, binary, whoever, young people watch this and they will say, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And this is the type of thing that I, I want to do. What is something that you want to tell them that you didn't know when you first started that journey? There's so many things. Like when I started, you know, I was like, I'm ancient, but like <laughs> the internet, you know, I remember like I had no idea what being a filmmaker was like, even though I love movies, I had no idea what path there was, what you need to do. I had no idea even what jobs there were. I didn't even know, like, I thought a director did everything. And I, did, and I think now information is power, right? And that's something Hansu always says, right? If the more you know, the more you set yourself up for success. And it's not just bad. And the key is to get good information because there's lots of bad information out there. Um, I would have saved myself so much trouble, I think, if I just learned about what the industry was, if I just learned how filmmaking was, as opposed to just making it, it just felt so uncodable, undecipherable. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's once again our goal with the Thousand Mile Project, but just get as much information out there as you can. And I do think that's empowering. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about you, Ria? You're sort of at the, you know, that you've gone that, gone through that beginning stage, um, what, what can you tell somebody who wants to say, oh, I want to make my own film, or I want to start my career in this business? What do you want to tell them? Yeah, I mean, I think there, it's interesting, Sue, Sue mentioned that there was a point where there was no internet. Now you're like going into the industry and there's almost too much internet. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of noise. And so I think one thing that that I've kind of reminded myself and I would tell someone now is um, just because other people have done it doesn't mean that you can't too. And I think, you know, often you see there feels to be this like kind of competitive edge on who's making content and how easy it is. But I think if you have your like North Star, these are the types of things that matter to me. This is the things that I have to say, um, you know, keep going that way, but know that the path there could take you in directions um, you may not no, you'd be going in. Like, if you asked me, you know, when I first started film school, Rhea, you know, you'd be sitting here speaking with one of your mentors about a show you got to work on and an incubator that you've, you're helping launch. I would say, yeah, right, sure. You know, that's not what I would imagine I'd be doing. And I'm so happy to have had these opportunities and be here because I think it, it really is a, I don't know if you call it the wild, wild west right now, but it's kind of, 
there's a lot of ways to get there. Yeah, yeah. yeah it definitely feels yeah. like. So we started with pachinko, so I kind of want to end with pachinko a little bit. Yeah. What's your favorite memory from making pachinko? I have so many. Yeah. Um, I mean, gosh, I have so many. Um, there's one scene that's an end of episode three, and it's between Sunja and Isak, and it's when he proposes to her. And it was near the end of our Korea shoot. I think it was like the third to last day of Korea. And already I was feeling very sad about leaving Korea. It was such an amazing experience shooting there in my homeland. And I'm behind the monitor and, uh, you know, Isak is asking her, like, could you leave your homeland? Could you, if someone else were to ask you? And just watching both Steve and Minha's performance. I mean, these are words on a page, right? I mean, that's all they are. And then you hear them being delivered by these actors. And I'm just sobbing behind the monitor. Like, just, I just couldn't stop crying. And I remember uh, two people, Hansel and Richard, came up to me and they were like, Are you okay? <laughs> and just giving me tissues, just feeding me tissues throughout the whole scene. Um, and I, that that memory stands out to me because it was it really is just that tingle you get when you watch your words be delivered by people who were meant to deliver it. That's amazing. What surprised you most, other than the pandemic and everything? Else, yeah. But... I think it was surprising how hard the language aspect was. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I know that's it's amazing. Like you would think you. Translations, how hard can translations be? Translations are impossible. Yeah. But even beyond translating the script, just the number of languages we had on set, we had as many translators on set as we had. Um, and I always felt like I wish I had a documentary filmmaker here to talk right. to film this because it was, it, it was, it was really hard in the beginning. But also, this may be one of my favorite memories as well. Is I always say the end of the shoot, you see. People stop speaking and they're gesturing, and they all, they just have this code that's figured out. And you guys, we can transcend language, but it is a barrier. Yeah. yeah. But I'm sure I will all transcend that language barrier when um, Pachinko premieres March 25th on Apple TV, and we can't wait to see it. Thank this you. Is, I can't. I can't believe it's done. Like, <laughs> I saw it. I can't believe, I can't it's so believe it. I, know. I, I can't imagine how you feel. So congratulations. Thank you. And what's next? Um, Do you want to just take a break for a while? <laughs> uh, I think, you know, hopefully season two. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want people to watch season one. Yeah. And I'm sure they will because it's yeah. absolutely gorgeous. And, Thank um, you. And so that's all we have. Um, for tonight's very special thanks to Peter, our IT director, for making this live webcast a possibility, and to our interns Subin and Caitlin for getting all the questions and doing all the social media postings and email outreach, and of course our thanks to the Young Ones and Foundation for its generous support of YPN, and to you, our members and viewers. We hope you'll join us again. Check out what's coming up on our website, KoreaSociety.org where you can sign up to receive our emails or join us as a member and make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining us and good night. Thank you. Yeah, that's so fun.